this is our, our final day together, our final moments together. I don't want to go long, but I need to go strong in terms of um, the message I, I come to bring. Our centering moment is um, courtesy of a Native American um, writer and poet, Sherman Alexi. And I share, it's, it's from a poem uh, um, entitled Him. This is just an excerpt. I will sing for people who might not sing for me. I will sing for people who are not my family. I will sing honor songs for the unfamiliar and new. I will visit a different church and pray in a different pew. I will silently sit and carefully listen to new stories about other people's tragedies and glories. I will not assume my pain and joy are better. I will not claim my people invented gravity or weather. And, oh, I know I will still feel my rage and rage and rage, but I won't act like I'm the only person on stage. I am one more citizen marching against hatred. Alone, we are defenseless. Collected, we are sacred. The topic for our conversation, our, our meditations for uh, this fine morning, no weapon formed, the gospel according to Black Lives Matter. Now, uh, it's usually uh, my, my wife's uh, stock and trade not to overanalyze or explain uh, the images. I'm of a different philosophy on that, especially since we have to hit the ground running so, uh, so fast and so uh, nimbly. So the image you see before you, this young woman standing in front of uh, these armed SWAT tactical police officers. On Saturday of July 16, 2016, this image was captured by a, a Reuters news uh, photographer by the name of Jonathan Bachman. The young woman, Aisha Evans, she was part of a large protest in, in the city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. If folks remember that time and that place, this was just on, just in the shadow of the murder of Alton Sterling, the young man who was outside of a, a little gas station convenience store, who for the high crime and misdemeanor of selling uh, CDs and, and uh, um, mixtapes out of, out of the trunk of his car, he was murdered by uh, Baton Rouge police officers. Okay, and this was if you remember that summer of racial reckoning, as opposed to the recent summer of racial reckoning, which followed the other summer of racial, racial reckoning, we've had a lot of reckonings, y'all. Uh, in this instance, the photographer captured this moment, right? And sometimes we have to catch hold of the moments in our lives because much like a leaf caught in the wind, if you fail to recognize, if you fail to notice God's working in, in certain moments, You've missed it all, right? You know, um, much like uh, my wife's favorite novel, uh, The Color Purple, there's a, a classic passage in there that God gets mad when you, you fail to notice the color purple, you know, in the field, right? That God put these things in our lives for, for some peculiar, some odd, strange reason. It's, it's left to us to discern how and why. But in this moment, you, you also see the odds that are at stake here. This lone woman, unarmed, unarmored, standing before the, the collected and amassed weight of the state, the weaponized arm of our de democratic republic while it still stands. By enacting her First Amendment right, the same First Amendment right that allows us the freedom of religion, same First Amendment right that allows me as an academic, but also as a US citizen, my freedom of speech, the same First Amendment that allows us here and now to assemble peacefully, to gather one to another, to exchange and impart information that might be helpful, useful, sometimes amusing, <laughs> all right. The same First Amendment that enables us to print books, newspapers, various means of publication, both in, you know, in that old black and white uh, script, but also in electronic or digital form. 
right? These same rights. And yet, in order to protest and proclaim that the murder of any of God's children as part of any of God's creation was somehow unworthy and unacceptable by the state, these are the terms by which, these are the terms and conditions by which Aisha Evans and countless other folks, just talking about the summer of 2016, were, were up against. And so I find this as an important visual uh, representation that it also stands alongside, at least in my imagination, it stands alongside famous photos from well over 50 years of young college students amassed before National Guardsmen in Kent State, Ohio, denouncing the Vietnam War. It, in my mind, holds place in the same legacy and tradition as young civil rights protesters in a little city known as Birmingham, Alabama, a place that we're now hearing about if, if you haven't checked the news because there was, a, once again, another mass shooting. We'll, we'll talk more about that momentarily. But back in the 1960s, when it was the site of one of the most heated battles for the civil rights movement on the streets of Birmingham, Alabama, which ultimately landed Dr. King in Birmingham jail, right? This picture can also transport us mentally. Some of us are old enough to remember the student uprisings in Tiananmen Square in China against the communist Chinese regime there where one lone figure was willing to stand against a, a, a fully locked and loaded tank. We count those images as brave depictions of courage and, and commitment to causes greater than the individual caught in the crosshairs. So I want to add this, this woman, this feat, this moment to that archive, if you will. But taking this a little step further and emphasizing and, and uh, immersing us into the conversation about Black Lives Matters itself, I want to take you back to 2013, when in the summer of that year, in the announcement that George Zimmerman, the lone gunman, the vigilante who took it upon himself to interrogate, to interrupt, Trayvon Martin, the young man uh, photoed here, some of y'all might remember his image, who simply uh, making his way back from a convenience store with Skittles and an Arizona iced tea in his own neighborhood, headed to his own house. He was being questioned by someone who's enacting powers that may have been part and parcel of his, his right to curiosity but he was no one's police officer. He was no one's paid security guard. He was no one's paramilitary deputy. And yet he took it upon himself to enact and enforce what Florida then and now refers to as its stand your ground law. Somehow the unarmed young black man was a threat to the armed assailant. Understand the, the illogic of that, if you will. In shooting and killing Trayvon Martin, we understand the, the, the trauma, the torment that uh, was unleashed during that period, even leading up to words that I never thought a U.S. Set, uh, president would ever say. Um, then President Barack Obama said that if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. Right? And immediately tried to not only extend some measure of sympathy to the family and to those of us who felt traumatized and, and demoralized by the event, but also actually empathize, use that platform, that office of, of the highest office of the land to actually engage in a mission and ministry, not as commander in chief, but as comforter in chief, a role that was uh, too often vacant over the last five years. But, I, I digress. 
But in the wake of the trial and, and subsequent exoneration, excusing, if you will, of George Zimmerman of the murder of Trayvon Martin, these three young women, Obel Tamati, Alicia Garza, and Patrice Cullors, in a exchange over social media, over you know Twitter, they just create the hashtag, three simple words, Black Lives Matter. And from that simple expression, we are now here in 2022, very familiar with how the avalanche of hashtags, social media protests and campaigns can be sparked. But at the time, it was relatively unknown and reasonably rare that such a thing would happen. But what we also have to grapple with here and why I say their names in, a, in tandem with Trayvon Martin's name is to help us remember, recall, and in some cases recover, right? Because now 10 years later, as we're about to deal with the 10th anniversary of this thing, right? The idea is not only looking at where we've come from, but also where are we now? And where do we hope to go with this? <clears throat> In the intervening years, right, there have been many racial and I would dare say racist traumas that have affected the nation. As I talked to you a few days ago about the incident surrounding uh, Dylan Roof, pictured here on his own social media feed, right, how he was ready, willing, and able to start a race war in his own imagination. And he believed that he was going to bring this war to first Charleston, South Carolina, but then hopefully that it would sweep the nation like, like a TikTok dance sensation. Right? The idea that many of the folks who would holler at any other protester for burning an American flag somehow found room in their hearts and space in their minds to, to see where this young man could be so enraged that he would burn the American flag but proudly wave the, the Confederate flag in its, in its place. Also, in his own writings, once again furnished uh, via social media, he explains that he had no choice. I have no choice but to engage in this behavior, right? Once again, dismantling this notion that racism was a thing of the past or was simply a seed of bitterness and hatred that was embedded in the hearts of older generations. But hopefully, prayerfully, thankfully, this younger generation gets it. They, they've moved beyond living, growing up in a, a um, America that witnessed the rise of the first president of African descent, of course they're not racist. Well, this belies that fact. But moreover, even in his own admissions, in his own writing and narrating of, of, his, of his impression right, of, of circumstances surrounding his need, his compulsion, to commence with this mass shooting at, at the Mother Emanuel Amy Church on that fatal Wednesday in June in 2015. The young man talks about having visited the Bible study at the church numerous times. The fact that the, the reverend, the pastor, Reverend Clemente Pickney, welcomed him, although he was not a congregant, obviously not a member of, of uh, the historically black church and the, the surrounding community, welcomed him with the love of Christ. The folks gathered in the Bible study Wednesday after Wednesday, seeing this young man make their, their attendance and their acquaintance, treated him with the open arms of hospitality, asked baby, do you need anything? Do you want anything? You good? In reaction and response to their treatment of him, he said, these people were nice to me. In fact, I was almost persuaded, words that echoed 
uh, from a, a New Testament scripture, some of y'all might recall. I was almost persuaded not to shoot them, but I had to because right, I can't, this is in the words of Dylan Roof, I can't go into the ghetto. I'd be overwhelmed, I'd be out, outnumbered and outgunned. So he settled for attacking the church because it was, in the words of many uh, folks in the um, law enforcement uh, um, sphere, it was a soft target. These people who extended nothing but Christian charity and hospitality allowed the wolf to come amongst the sheep. To try and contextualize and try to, as, as uh, um, the culture would, would suggest, to try and make it make sense, the author, the ethics, uh, the essays, I was going to say ethicist, and he is an ethical being, but the essayist, uh, Tanahasi Coates, in his uh, classic best selling book now, uh, Between the World and Me, he offers these two statements that at least begin to help shape this context that we're dealing with. First, I quote, Americans believe in the reality of race as a defined indubitable feature of the natural world. Racism, the need to ascribe bone deep features to people and then humiliate, reduce and destroy them inevitably follows from this inalterable condition. But race is the child of racism, not the father. And the process of naming quote unquote, the people has never been a matter of genealogy and physiognomy so much as hierarchy. Right? Where you are in the social ladder and the social scheme of things, how you fit, who's on top, who's below, that's the level of hierarchy that we're, we're grappling with. But to the next quote, to the next statement, Coates would later say, in accepting both the chaos of history and the fact of my total end, I was free to consider, truly consider how I wish to live, especially how do I live free in this black body? It is a profound question because America understands itself as God's handiwork, but the black body is the clearest evidence that America is the work of humans. Your human difference, my human difference, our human difference, is not an accident, it's not a mistake, right? I don't believe that God made me this way by mistake, by accident. I pray that you don't either in your own regard or anybody that you come across in your day's journey. Human difference to this point, you know, barring and elevating what Coates is saying, human Difference is not synonymous with deficiency or defectiveness. It should not be up to debate who gets to live and who gets to die. Right? Because a fascinating thing, we have a number of folks in this world who call themselves pro-life. And I'm hoping everybody who's living is at least 80, 20 percent pro-life, at least, you know, you know, all right, you know. But how, okay, yeah, think about it, yeah, at least, you know, you know, it should be more than a coin toss. But, okay, but as we go through this day's, this long day's journey from day to night, the issue that's at hand is many of these people who want to legislate and dictate bodily autonomy for various folks, reproductive rights, or as I was saying before, civil rights, human rights medical rights, and yet when you have mass shootings, when you have acts of police brutality, when you have wars either here or on foreign shores, suddenly pro-life goes out the window. We have much money for war, but we have no money to even begin to think about how could we help save the poor. If we talk about student loan debt forgiveness, if we talk about monies to, to relieve folks who've been crushed by the, the COVID-induced economic trials and travails, if we talk to, you know, I'm, I was born and raised up the road and uh, here in Jersey, so I know about property taxes and things that can be a crushing weight on many a family or just folks trying to make their way in this life. 
not a mum mumbling word, not a whisper. But if you're trying to negotiate and, and deliberate over how much money to send or, or uh, um, how much of the national budget should be dedicated to law enforcement or to the military budget, pfft, sky's the limit. All right, I digress. I'll keep it moving. But in this moment in which we find ourselves, this long moment, well over a decade, right, the NAACP just as of roughly circa 2014, 2015, had collected these images of victims of police violence or, or vigilante violence. And this screen still can't hold the entirety of those folks who had, who had been uh, stricken in this manner, okay? And yet, who is speaking out for the unseen? for the unheard, for the unnamed. If not the church, who does that work? Where does that work occur? It's unpleasant. It's not comfortable for me to just stand here before you now and say what I'm saying, but that doesn't mean it doesn't need to be said. To bring this into uh, greater fullness, to, into greater, greater perspective, in that year, that, that pivotal year of 2020, three incidents of this sort took place. First, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, the young man who simply for, once again, the, the atrocious and, and audacious crime of jogging through, through a construction site in Brunswick, Georgia, was hunted by three individuals descended upon as if he was uh, fresh prey, ready for the killing, and then summarily gunned down in the streets. We had a trial in Georgia, and I'm sad to say, I'm very sad to say that, not that the trial went, ran its course and ultimately upon uh, the final verdict, the individuals who, who gunned this young man down were found guilty, but the fact that much of the general population of this nation was surprised that this act, this, this heinous and heartless act, would be deemed unacceptable and unworthy for a civilized nation. That's what we're up against, y'all. Because if you contrast that with the situation of this young woman, Brianna Taylor, an EMT, a young woman who was trying to um, start her life fresh and anew because of a no-knock warrant that was executed upon faulty information by the Louisville uh, PD, police department. They engaged in a night nighttime raid looking for an ex-boyfriend who did not live on the premises and she had not been in conversation or, or any kind of contact with. Her current boyfriend was in the house and in his attempt to, invoking the laws of, of Kentucky, stand his ground, he presented a firearm, made, uh, um, he uh, fired a shot, in the direction of the sound, thinking that this was just a random break in. Because once again, understand no knock warrant means the police officers do not have to announce themselves. They did not declare their their presence or their purpose. So in the dark, in the middle of the night, hearing hearing a sound and fearing the worst. He did what supposedly the law allowed. Someone summarily, the police returned fire shooting, excuse me, shooting Brianna Taylor as she slept in her bed and firing wildly enough that when uh, the forensics team came to the property, they found bullets here, there, and everywhere, including other apartments. It was but for the grace of God that other people didn't die that night, but we are still wrestling with and worrying about Brianna Taylor. The fact that the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, one David Cameron, Daniel Cameron, excuse me, was unwilling to even bring charges against these police officers, 
despite the, the mountain of errors that led up to her untimely death, is still something that we have to reconcile and resolve. The fact that the policies and protocols that led to her untimely death still haven't been fully addressed, either at the state level or at the federal level. Where else, who else will speak on behalf of someone like Brown and Taylor? Last but certainly not least, George Floyd. On Memorial Day of 2020, Mr. Floyd was outside Cube Foods in Minneapolis, his newly adopted hometown. He had left his home state of, of Texas, right? His hometown of uh, Houston, hoping and here's where you know bitter irony comes into play, hoping that the Twin Cities, right, would be his rebirth, would be the place where he would get a fresh new start, a, a new lease on life. Being suspected of passing a, a, 20, a, a counterfeit $20 bill, the, the shopkeeper calls the, the local police, a team of four police officers, including uh, Derek Chauvin, who is a senior officer on, on hand, proceed to grab hold of Mr. Floyd, take him down to the ground. And then Chauvin does what we all now uh, have possibly embra emblazoned on some corner of our mind, right? Places his knee on Floyd's neck. Now, what becomes for me, uh, intractable here is a human being can go without food for about three weeks. The longest time that we've measured that someone could go without sleep is approximately 12 consecutive days. Don't try that at home. Typically, an average person can last about three or four days without water. But according to medical statistics, we cannot survive more than three minutes without oxygen. So by that standard, the incident that involved George Floyd that, that fatal morning was well over three times the amount of time that it would take to expunge, to, to extract the last breath of life, right? And when we think about breath, and y'all know better than I, right? Y'all are proclaimers of the gospel, right? We talk about ruach, right? The breath of God, the wind of God. That was just the animating force within and for each and every one of us. When you take that from another person, right, there is weight and consequence to that. That matters. In a way to try and bring these, these issues and ideas into some for, frame, in which young people could understand, the author, uh, Angie Thomas, um, penned the novel, uh, The Hate You Give, which subsequently uh, was turned into a movie, a Hollywood film, right? Uh, the poster here um, before us. I grappled with this. In fact, uh, myself and Dr. Stacey, we have a young daughter at the time. I think she was about mm, maybe 11 or so. And we, we had to weigh the options of taking her to see the movie, right? right? Because first, to frame the narrative, especially from the point of view where oftentimes we're only looking at victimhood, only looking at um, what folks would, would call um, black pain as, as a pornographic uh, sensation, where, as I was just suggesting, when we saw footage, video clips of, of what happened to George Floyd or what happened to Eric Garner or what happened to countless other victims that we've uh, um, memorialized in, in the Black Lives Matters movement, right? To have these video clips on constant rotation, right? Um, through social media, through uh, cable, late night news and, and things of that sort. On the one hand, we have to see this ugliness, we have to see this hurt, this hate, this pain in order to know that's happened. But then on the other hand, do we even have the resources or recourses as a, as a people, as a nation, to help bind the wounds that, that were created or are being created by having folks deal with this? 
So what Angie Thomas was able to do through this YA novel, this young adult novel, you know, usually a space where you have, you know, magical little uh, wizard boys, you know, waving wands and going to, you know, far off uh, Hogwarts, right, to, you know, get their uh, magical gaming on, right? As opposed to, you know, swords and dragons or, or you know, spaceships and, and use of the force, right? She used the YA space to try and sensitize a generation to Black Lives Matters. A situation that may have infinitely more impact on their lives than, you know, Baltimore. But anyway, <clears throat> to briefly um, give a sense of what's going on here, because part of the concern here is that it's great to think that Black Lives Matter was simply a, a, a moment. So, oh yeah, 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 people got fired up in 2013 and 14. People got really up in arms in 2016. Oh yeah, people really came out in force in 2020. But then constantly seeing these highs and lows, highs and lows. Or to think that it's simply about monuments. So, Simply thinking that when Black Lives Matter pops up, the best way to remedy the crisis or situation is to take down a Confederate flag here, go after a, a Confederate monument there. Interesting and fun fact, none of the Confederate monuments were erected when the Confederacy as, as an actual na nation state was in, in existence. Most of them were created you know, just in the ramp up to the uh, um, First World War. Oddly enough, I'm just saying, right? So even the folks who supported the Confederacy didn't support Confederate monuments, but I digress. But to actually think about this as a movement, right? In the 10 years since the, the birth of the hashtag, we had the creation of the Black Lives Matter Global Network, the Black Futures Lab, which Okay, so Black Lives Matter's global network emphasizing the protest movement, the idea that worldwide we have branches of Black Lives Matters, not just throughout the United States, Canada, but we've got Black Lives Matters, Mexico City. You've got Black Lives Matters, Sao Paulo. Sorry. We've got Black Lives Matters branches in London, in Paris, Brussels. We've got Black Lives Matters branches in Lagos, Nigeria in Accra, Ghana, got Black Lives Matters outposts in Hong Kong, in the Gaza, that folks who are sympathetic to this cause don't have to be directly impacted by this cause. Oh, sorry. The Black Futures Lab shifts many of those interests and efforts into conversations about, or how do we vote our, our values? How do we enforce and enact political reforms to guarantee that human existence is not compromised? The movement for Black Lives is a much more um, academic branch of the movement to try and, and enable and establish that the teaching, in some cases even the preaching, of these principles can be more widely and, and uh, um, generously dispersed throughout the society. And last but certainly not least, Campaign Zero was another branch of the movement that especially took rise in 2020 and largely was uh, um, responsible for, among other things, the, the notion of defund the police. Right? And I know that that term is quite controversial and has uh, been held up to great scrutiny. But the idea, especially as we've seen most recently in Uvalde, but Uvalde is not a, a isolated case, is the premise of how are we being protected from various forms of, of hate and violence when even though the folks who are supposed to protect and guard us from harm are afraid from the folks who are doing great harm. And also, I'll just interject with this briefly. If you're having a domestic dispute or if somebody's having a mental health crisis, is always the first and best response to that someone who has weapons training 
and his arm to the teeth. If you've got a cat stuck up in a tree, is someone you know, who's going to roll up like Rambo the, the absolute best solution to that, per, that problem? So that we can more uh, generally understand what we're talking about here and how I believe that in many ways, the, the long term, larger concerns of Black Lives Matters should be enveloped largely in our own Christian witness and our own personal principled concern about the sanctity of human life. Expansive, but Black Lives Matters believes that in order to win and bring as many people as possible along with us along the way, moving beyond the narrow nationalism that is too prevalent in black communities, but I would dare argue in all communities, right? That this thing that we're wrestling with and for is greater than you and me alone. Okay, inclusive. Members of the movement affirm that lives of black, queer, and trans folk, disabled folks, undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all lives across the gender spectrum ought to matter. These, and it's, it's shameful, it's virtually disgraceful that we even have to articulate that, but let's, let's just uh, keep it real. These networks center on those who have been marginalized within the past and even the present of liberationist movements. Okay, here's where it gets really juicy. Life-centered. The movement is working for a world where black lives are no longer systematically targeted for death and demise. Right? If you emphasize life, not just my life, not just your life, not just their lives, but all lives, right? Life should not have to depend on the descriptor or modifier that precedes it. Right? We shouldn't have to depend on saying all lives matter. It, that should have been taken as a, a given, but it seems that with each passing week, month, year, I'm forced to question whether that's the fact. And last, humane. The movement affirms our humanity, our contributions to the society and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. But when, where, why, and how we protest, and when that protest is deemed a problem, right? We've just come out of a season now where you had, for the sake of expediency, does anyone recall that in the summer, I believe it is of, of uh, late summer of 2020, when the FBI foiled a, a plot to kidnap uh, um, uh, Michigan Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer, a, 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 our militia wanted to mobilize against her be, and you know, kidnap her and God only knows what else they were gonna to do to her in the process because she had the nerve to, to impose shutdowns at the moment where the pandemic was first, you know, exploding throughout much of Michigan, especially in the Detroit metro area, what had the nerve to wanna to save lives. So they were gonna take hers. Now, granted, if you were like our household, right, in those early days, weeks and days of the pandemic, right, we were believing any, any preventative measure was, was necessary, right? Trust me, y'all, we were putting mail in the microwave. We were dousing groceries with, with Lysol. Trust me, mail got burnt. Them, them bags of groceries were dripping wet, <laughs> okay? But we were doing whatever humanly possible to save our lives and the lives of those around us. And yet, some folks felt that it was their right, their God-given right to protest and not just protest with their voices and their, their bodies, but bring out arms. You know, we've, we've heard much in recent days about AR-15s and other semi-automatic weapons, right? Where you can have folks gathered around state houses with, with these weapons of war, and yet, hmm, well, that's, whoa, that's quaint. Uh, well, yeah, hey, yeah, like, hey, what, so, hey, what's your, what's your ammo clip? Hey, what's that capacity? Hey, okay, it's got a little kick, doesn't it? Right, having friendly chit-chat, but if you are standing in defense of school children who have been murdered, if you're standing in alliance with members of a synagogue named the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh who were brutally gunned down by an anti-Semite, if you're standing locked arm in arm in Atlanta trying to denounce 
stop Asian hate, right? Suddenly you're the problem or you're the oddball in a nation that not only pro proclaims itself to be Christian, but Protestant, you know, guess, guess what? Pro protest is built into Protestantism, right? The idea of what are you protesting for? What do you stand for? What, what are we holding sacred, right? I grapple with this in terms of even in dealing with our modes of protest, right? As, as the former slide was saying, it's like, if we have a silent protest, folks are, are upset and you know uneasy. If we have a loud, visible, vibrant protest, folks are unnerved. If we simply take a knee, I'm gonna do this. I may need Tylenol and a little bit of assistance later, but I'm on, I'm on bended knee, right? If you take a knee, you're somehow desecrating your, your cause. And yet, when we wrestle with, just in the span of four years, the notion that Colin Kaepernick taking a knee on the football field versus Chauvin taking a knee on George Floyd's neck, which was more alarming, which was more outrageous, which was more devastating. If you listen to certain pundits, they would help to make the case that the one that wasn't fatal was the one that we shouldn't be concerned about. So moving along, part of why I'm, I'm up here trying to emphasize this to you is when we think about legitimacy in, and public trust in our society, in our culture, right? The criminologist, uh, Thomas Tyler, he offers the statement that, quote, to test the importance of self-interest, one must differentiate the legitimacy of authorities and legal institutions from the degree to which their legitimacy is linked to self-interest or normative judgments. Right? As we move through this world, whether you're talking about the church, the state, the academy, or any of our households, right? We un operate under certain laws, certain codes, right? The, the good, uh, Woman of God, Jeanette, she was uh, preaching to us about the household codes uh, not so long ago, as written in, in Peter. First, we're supposed to operate in accordance with these laws because there's the promise of fairness, that somehow, some way, if these rules, if these regulations, if these laws are, are imparted, that there's a guarantee that they apply equally and fully to all of us, that there's none higher, none lower, we're all equal under the law. The perception, okay, that simply because of my body type, my skin color, my social economic class, my education, I should not be exempt from these, the, the, the influence or the impact of these, these laws, but you also shouldn't impose them more harshly and quickly upon me because of those things either. And then last but not least, the practice of fairness, right? So if you have a speed, speed law, you know, going up and down Route 9, right here locally, right, it shouldn't, it shouldn't apply differently if you have a busted down pickup truck or, or a beautiful brand new Bentley. The pra oh gosh, come on. Okay. All right. Okay. Here. Artificial intelligence, uh, uh, yeah, artificial intelligence meets natural stupidity. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. But I, I bring to you the words of, of the patron saint of the Black Lives Movement, uh, James Baldwin, when he makes this argument. Well, if no one really knows, wishes to know how justice is administered in a country, one does not question the policemen, the lawyers, the judges, or the protected members of the middle class. One goes to the unprotected, those precisely who need the law's protection most, and listens to their testimony. Ask any Mexican, any Puerto Rican, any black man, any poor person, ask the wretched how they fare in the halls of justice, and then you will know not whether or not the country is just, but whether or not it has any love for justice or any concept of it, it is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Oh.
Let's go here. So as I wrap up, and I thank you, uh, thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties. But as we wrap up, one angle specifically that I want to emphasize in the, the discourse of Black Lives Matter is that we have to pay attention to gun violence in this nation, right? We are not one nation under God. We are one nation under the gun, right? If the gun matters more than your belief in Jesus Christ, heaven's hero, earth's emancipator, that angelic avenger, right? right? If you're willing to go to the mattresses, so to speak, borrowing from the uh, Godfather, hashtag Coppola. Uh, okay. If you're willing to go to the mat for the NRA rather than the Nazarene, I have problems with you and we're going to have to discuss these things. Uh, this picture that you see here is the uh, young family, Parker, right young age of 33, his wife, Jalen, and their kids over there in Posey, Indiana, Poseyville, Indiana. Oh, by the way, that church in the background. Uh, Parker's the pastor of that church. These weapons all belong to the family. I'm just conflicted. How do you express your faith in God that, you know, and then also, but I need these weapons to feel safe. Or, or maybe it's just for fun. Then I have to I have to ask you, what's your definition of fun? Okay, right, why, why is this necessary? Right? Can't be that much hunting going on in Indiana. Just can't be. When we try to process this, just in the last year, 10 people in Japan shot dead with, with handguns, with firearms, right? As opposed to 38, and now that number is, is irrelevant because the number is upward, ticking upwards. That graph that I have on, on, you know, my left, your right, of mass shootings in the United States, especially since the 1980s, right? Let, let me just share with you a couple of quick tidbits. Okay. First, the reason why we start at 1980 isn't because there were no shootings in the pre previous era. It was just that, interestingly enough, those crime statistics just weren't available, that nobody thought to tabulate and collect those, those statistics. Also, does anybody else know what a, a triggering, in, sorry, poor choice of words, um, what an inciting incident for starting to map gun violence from 1980 might be? Right, President Reagan was, was gunned down, not killed, you know, thankfully not killed, by John David Hinckley, or John Hinckley Jr., who, interestingly enough, was just released after 41 years. Fun fact. Um, uh, because he was held uh, um, mentally unstable at the time of the shooting. Okay? Does anybody know during this period, this intervening period, why the, although it's, it's an abomination that any gun violence happened during this period, Right. What, what suppressed those numbers? The Brady, the James Brady assault weapons ban, right? This bright, shiny red line, you know, right here was when that gun law was allowed to expire, especially under the banner of George W. Bush's conservative or, um, yeah, compassionate conservatism. Fun with words. So therefore, in the intervening period that we are now living through, that many of our children and sadly even our children's children are living through, we've seen this eruption, this explosion. Last piece of uh, information that I want to share with you is that this data wasn't collected by the Justice Department, not the FBI or any branch of, of it was given to us by the CDC. No, 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 and I mean, yeah, yeah, we can, we can have a good chuckle about it. But with many of our conservative uh, brothers and sisters and others making the case that, oh, mass shootings and, and this form of gun violence is it's, it's mental illness. Okay, okay, then 
What are we going to do to ramp up funding and support for mental health in America? Well, nothing, right? That's not the government's responsibility. So the government will not stand in, in the way of the violence as a law enforcement issue, but also even though it's been declared and, and decried as a mental health issue, you're not going to step up. Wait, okay, so if you have a burning house and the fire department shows up, but they said, well, let's, let's see how this plays out. Let's just let it burn and then you know, we'll, we'll deal with what's left. That's the kind of illogic that we're grappling with here. Also, one last piece to, to problematize here is, because now, unfortunately, uh, folks in Buffalo, in Irvine, in Uvalde, are starting to now uh, go after the gun manufacturers, right? Okay, and you know, we're, we're, we're a lawsuit nation. You know, Americans like to sue folk, uh, last I heard. All right, litigious. But what's the problem with that? And I'm, uh, you know, this is where we get interactive. What's the problem with that notion? Okay, why are they protected though? Why are people who are not protecting us protected? Okay, okay, we're gonna we're gonna pick that up. Limited liability for their products. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because now this notion of intentionality is like, well, how do you know that they meant to do this with that weapon and that precise bullet, right? That bullet didn't know what it was being used for. Okay. But let's also once again circle back to the limited liability piece, right? If I'm not going to call out any uh, car manufacturers because I don't want to hurt anybody's business or help anybody's cause, but if if a car manufacturer goes through a recall because the, they have faulty brakes or their air bags don't deploy, you can sue them because they they sold you a defective item, right? If you if a yogurt company or or if uh, you know if someone who makes a wonderful brand of of yoga pants, right? If their merchandise is flawed or, or fails you at a critical moment, you can complain and, you know, demand retribution, right? You know, some kind of restoration, right? Gun manufacturers in this notion of limited liability, right? If their weapon kills you, it accomplished its goal, right? That was not a flaw of the, the product. That was a feature. No, I mean, yeah, it's absurd. It's obscene, but it's also sadly the, the governing logic of our land. This, this quote, I was reading through the Washington Post. They were fact checking a, a claim that uh, President Biden made, unfortunately, in the wake of the many mass shootings we had. And he said that so many uh, school age children had been murdered. Oh, sorry, sorry. The notion that more children die by gunfire in a year than on duty police officers and active duty military. And we, we're, we're at ease with this, or we say, oh, well, what can we do? I lift this tweet up from uh, Amanda Gordon, Gorman that it takes a monster to kill children, no doubt. I, I don't quarrel or quibble with that. But to watch monsters kill children again and again and do nothing isn't just insanity, it's inhumanity. All right. A colleague, a dear, dear friend and colleague up the road at that little school up in New Haven, um, Mirsoff Wolf, he makes this statement that there's something deeply hypocritical about praying for a problem you are unwilling to resolve, right? If you look at, but even worse, if you look away from a crisis in our time that should haunt our mind and do nothing about it, we have failed. We have failed ourselves, we've failed our communities, we've failed this nation, we've failed this generation, we have failed this world. So as I, I get ready to step away and, and be quiet and the computers quit without me, the framing scripture for, for today's conversation has been Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against ye shall prosper. 
right? Now, I'm not a biblicist. I warned you about that the other day. But in my humble but holy imagination, when I look at that scripture, it doesn't tell me that there are no weapons in this world. No, that's not true. Right? It doesn't say that no weapons will ever be made or formed in this world. That is not true. But it does tell me in my faith in God and in Christ Jesus that no weapon formed against me, against us, shall prosper. Right? No one, no how, should prosper by creating and using these weapons. Right? And if that prosperity, that so-called prosperity is someone else's peace of mind, that the only way that they can resolve or, or rectify a dispute is by might making right. If the only way they think that they can deal with the, the problems and the worries of the world today is by killing everyone who looks different or lives different than them, God will not be pleased. God will not be mocked. So as I said on Tuesday, I say it again. In our holy and sacred spaces and places, if folks are not at least touching on these issues, what are we there for? What are we there for? Right? And I know that, once again, as I said before, and I'll stop on this note, I know this is not easy conversation. I know that this, you know, this doesn't make us, you know, all happy and shiny people in having these conversations, but I'd rather be alive and, and still making this case until the last breath in my body than to be silent and safe relatively speaking, because none of us knows when, unfortunately, we'll be splashed on the headlines. So rather than face that awful day in silence, I'd rather you know stand up and, and make a little bit of what John Lewis called good trouble. Thank you so much for your patience and day.